Yes. Good. Okay, so um, my name is Krishna Kumar, and um, I basically work uh, in this group at Microsoft that focuses on evangelism. So literally what I do is I get in front of uh, you know, researchers and faculty um, centrally around the U.S. and talk about you know, developer-focused technologies <clears throat> like you know, Windows Azure. Cloud computing is something I've been doing for the last couple of years, you know, ever since we introduced Azure, so I'm really excited to sort of talk about that here today. Uh, this talk actually is going to be a slight modification from a similar talk I gave at uh, Microsoft Research Cloud Futures last year. Uh, but the point I want to make here is I want to make sure that it's customized for this audience. So let's keep this super interactive. I, mean, I really don't have to go through all the you know, slide deck content that I have. And, and Jan's uploading it right now. So you have that content already. So I'm happy to deviate and talk about other interesting things if, if you want. Uh, before we get started, just so I'm, I'm sort of level setting at the right you know, um, level, how many of you worked with, in some way, shape, or form with the cloud before? Uh, about two or three hands, OK. And how many of you have looked at Windows Azure? Two or three, OK. So I think, I think the content is at the right level. So what we'll really quickly do um, over the next 60 minutes is basically just in one slide, introduce the cloud so we're all on the same page in terms of what the cloud means. Because you know, it's one of those things that you ask 20 people, you get 40 different opinions of what the cloud is, right? So for purposes of Windows Azure and this talk, we'll define what the cloud is. Then we'll really quickly look at you know, scenarios that make sense for the cloud that you know, uh, are most commonly used in the cloud, and then jump into Windows Azure. We'll look at the different components of Windows Azure. What I'm gonna, the way I'm going to structure, structure it is I'm going to give you an all-up view of everything that's in Windows Azure, right? Whatever is in the platform. And then we'll sort of drill down and sort of get into the uh, portal and start programming just briefly with Windows Azure. I will leave you with you know, pointers and resources to where you can find content that will take you from where we left off uh, and, and sort of go from there. So that's going to be the overall um, flow. So like I said, what is cloud computing? This is going to be my one slide definition. So the way we look at cloud computing is a cloud is an offline you know, location agnostic um, set of infrastructure, resources, whatever, that is used to store data and run applications. And I think here's the fundamental disconnect. If you talk to a lot of you know, uh, folks, they'll be like, you know, we've done cloud computing for years. You know, if you store data someplace else other than your infrastructure, you're using the cloud. Well, technically, yes. But in terms of computing, we sort of qualify it as being able to run your applications on the cloud. Right? So what Azure lets you do, and this is basically it. This is all that Azure does. Azure lets you upload your data to the cloud. And Azure lets you upload your applications to the cloud. And that's the fundamental premise of cloud computing. We will take your app and run it on the same infrastructure that powers Bing and Hotmail and all of those uh, properties. And you do not have to worry about a couple of things, things like scale, right? You don't have to worry about provisioning 10 servers because you anticipate this load. Or you don't have to worry about you know, uh, provisioning more and more as your audience base grows, right? All of that is completely elastic. We take care of um, you know, provisioning and deprovisioning um, and allocating and deallocating resources. We also provide you a utility billing model. So literally, you only pay for what you use. So think of the whole um, cloud computing boiling down to sort of the utility model of computing, where you pay only for what you use, and that usage and resource allocation is elastic. That's basically it. Um, I, I basically said, I mean, that's basically what the cloud is. And there are certain traditional kinds of applications that make sense to do on the cloud. Obviously, not every kind of app is going to be you know, the best case uh, scenario for the cloud. We sort of broadly categorize you know, this quadrant, I mean, these four kinds of um, apps. Any app that basically has an on-off uh, property. You know, it, it, an app runs for a certain amount of time and then doesn't for a certain amount of time or an app that's basically doing some level of bursting, right? I mean, whether it's predictable or unpredictable, your, your um, peak usage characteristic is significantly above your average usage characteristic, right? 
in all of these cases, the cloud is perfect because the elastic nature of the cloud will only require this amount of compute resources when the demand's low. But when the demand spikes up, the cloud will literally expand. It'll give you more infrastructure to cover the spike in your um, demand. And then once the demand goes away, the resources get pulled back. And literally, your cost curve very closely follows this curve as well. So I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail as to why this is a good thing, because as you can imagine, if the cloud didn't do that, you would have to provision for peak, right? I mean, you would have to buy enough compute storage resources to handle this level. So for all this other time, when your service is not running in peak capacity, those resources are getting wasted, right? So in all of these cases, the cloud's amazing. Or in an unpredictable case where you do not know if your service is going to require more resources, uh, the cloud's great as well. Now, this is the traditional slide we, we use with enterprises, right? These are you know, companies, and, and we basically help them analyze their apps and see if any of them fall in this bucket to help them you know, see if they want to migrate that to the cloud. For this audience, however, I want to talk about big data. Right? I mean, past couple of days, that's all we've been talking, vast amounts of data. And uh, I borrowed these slides, actually, from um, a faculty member at University of Washington. But I think this does a really good job of explaining what the cloud is going to be used for uh, in the very present and coming future. Um, so just basically all of science and research, for instance, has followed uh, um, a progression, if you will. It started off with theory, right? Before we had um, you know, uh, experimentation capabilities, before we had all the cool devices, you, know, you just theorize. And then later you experiment and you basically confirm or deny, validate or invalidate the theory. Then sort of uh, there was this whole phase of observation at, at, at uh, some point where basically you'd observe data. I mean, you'd observe phenomena, collect data. And then it moved to this whole computational phase where all of that data that has been collected now basically gets processed and crunched and, and simulations happen and modeling happens. Lately, we've been seeing this whole new field emerge called e-science, as you know, everybody knows here. And one of the key fundamental defining characteristics of e-science is the vast amounts of data that gets computed, that gets collected and computed um, through the process. Just to give you a quick example, um, the amount of data that the current generation telescope, the Apache Point uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope amasses, is of the order of 80 terabytes over a seven-year period, right? So over a significant amount of time, they've amassed a significant amount of data. And to put this in perspective, here's a statistic that says that um, this telescope collected more data in the first few weeks than had been amassed in the entire history of astronomy, right? So it just gives you a scale for the data-intensive kinds of um, applications we are using today. This new telescope that's going to come up uh, um, it's basically down the road from me. I live in Chicago, and this is in Urbana-Champaign uh, at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. They're coming up with a new uh, large synoptic survey telescope. Uh, it's going to be installed in Chile, and that is going to acquire 140 terabytes of data every five days. Right? And just to give you an idea, these are some of the infrastructural requirements that have been set up to get this operational. And you'll be like, why? Why do we need to amass so much data? And this sort of gives you a, a sort of a, a perspective. This is the current, current generation telescope. And you see the resolution's pretty limited, right? I mean, you cannot make out, you cannot resolve certain smaller you know, nebular objects that are in the sky. Whereas with the newer model telescope that we are anticipating come, come up in 2016, we'll, we'll be able to resolve far smaller objects in a much better fashion. So, it was really exciting. I was actually just, this was so coincidental, just like 10 days ago, I was speaking with one of the architects of the LSST at NCSA, and, and he was talking about the amount of data, what they're going to do with all that data, and I was talking to him about what plans do they have for saving that data, and how do they plan to um, you know, sort of process that data. And he was saying, at this point, like today, I mean, if he had to go operational, he, he said that he'd basically have to throw away most of the data that's coming in. Just because they don't have the infrastructure to handle it. And, and even the cloud in this case would not be a perfect scenario because imagine how long it's going to take to upload 140 terabytes of you know, 
data, right? So I mean, it's, it's some of these interesting challenges that make this field so exciting. So they're basically coming up with sort of a tiered uh, solution where the incoming data is going to be in a local warehouse and it's going to get processed and then basically sent up to the, um, some of that processed filtered data is going to be sent up to the cloud, which will then be further processed and so on and so forth. Um, some other examples, the Large Hadron Collider, you know, generates again a huge amount of data. Uh, you know, if, and if you think these are these multi-billion dollar projects, actually no, I mean closer to home, some of these little desktop sized you know, genome sequencers produce vast quantities of data. So the point I'm trying to make is, we live in a world where science is driven by data collection and, and sensors all over the world. And so basically, being able to analyze data at this scale is something that the cloud excels in, right? I mean, we've been talking about you know, HPC and, and all of that. It's basically the cloud sort of, if you will, is sort of built for that scenario. So with that, uh, I'm probably not going to spend a whole amount of time on these business statistics for you know, big data scenario, except to po probably point out maybe the last couple of points. Uh, Walmart, everybody knows Walmart. Uh, basically uh, has data warehouses, databases, totaling close to like in the petabyte range, and, and they must have grown in the time frame that, you know, the slide deck has been around. Uh, this sort of puts in perspective. Mankind created 150 exabytes of data in 2005. This year it'll create 1,200 exabytes. Interesting, but the human mind sort of has a limit in terms of how much, you know, vast numbers it can absorb. So to put this again in perspective, in the last nine years, or 10 years actually, uh, the, basically the beginning of the 21st century, we have created more data than has been amassed in the entire history of humankind up until that point. So imagine, you know, beginning of mankind to the year 2000, and 2001 to 2010, basically um, we've created more data in the past 10 years. And, and we're gonna exceed that, ra that, that amount of data in the next three to four years, right? So where's all this data gonna go? We really don't have any storage space to store these in, right? If you if you look at some of these statistics, our ability to store data has far far fallen behind our ability to create data or the rate at which we're creating data. So the the future it seems is is in the is looking as though we're going to just basically do real time analyses of data, and then the cloud really is the way to go. Some quick statistics from Facebook and and Google. These are dated, slightly dated. Uh, but just to give you an, a perspective of what some of these big properties on the internet look like as well. So um, all of these different kinds of applications will be benefited by the cloud. So having said that, let's sort of do sort of a slightly deeper dive into cloud computing and look at the different versions of the cloud, if you will, right? If you look at any you know uh, literature on the cloud or speak to anybody from the cloud you know, perspective, they basically point to three sort of segregations, if you will, of the services that, are, that the cloud can provide. Uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service, right? As the name suggests, with infrastructure as a service, what happens is a cloud provider, and Amazon's probably the best example for the scenario, a cloud provider will provide you raw infrastructure, right? So you'll get literally a box in the sky. You'll get an IP address or, I mean, you'll get one or how many ever machines you request on the cloud. So you'll get an IP address that will connect to that machine. And that machine belongs to you. Um, you can install whatever operating system you want on it. You can install whatever tool set you want on it uh, and, and run any application that you want on it. The flip side of the coin is that the administration of that machine is also your responsibility, right? If an update needs to be patched, I mean, if an update needs to be applied, or if a machine needs to be patched, if a machine needs to be rebooted, whatever, all of that maintenance is also on you. Um, the next level is platform as a service, where the vendor doesn't provide you with a raw box. What the vendor does is sort of installs a bunch of uh, lower level software on the machine, like the operating system, like the you know the runtime for whatever platform that you're interested in. It could be Java, it could be .NET. So they install a bunch of runtimes and expose that machine using a set of APIs. So you basically can upload an application. You can basically build an application and upload it, and the platform as a service model will take that app and run it uh, seamlessly across multiple machines without giving you 
the headache of worrying about each and every single machine and you know, uh, patching and upgrading each and every single machine. And finally, software as a service scenario basically is just uh, a model where um, you are, all you are exposed to is a sort of a web front end and then everything else happens um, you know, behind the scenes in the cloud, uh, the cloud model. Any questions so far? Okay. So what we're going to explore now uh, is Windows Azure, and I'm going to show you basically how Windows Azure allows, is, is mostly a platform as a service. Windows Azure is sort of a classic platform as a service scenario, uh, but you're able to see elements of infrastructure as a service as well in our offering. So this basically, just sort of in a visual fashion, represents what we just talked about. Um, in infrastructure as a service, the vendor worries about the actual hardware. They'll, they'll you know, set up the machine, set up the networking. But anything OS and above is your problem. Uh, platform as a service, all of the infrastructural software is handled by the vendor. You just basically get a unified platform, .NET platform or a consistent set of APIs. And all you do is just write an application uh, and upload it to the cloud. The, versus software as a service, uh, you basically don't have any level of control on what the cloud does or exposes. You can basically consume the cloud using a web browser. And uh, applications like Office, uh, Live, or Salesforce are an example of software as a service. Um, I'm going to jump through. Uh, this, again, recaps most of it. Uh, the only thing I wanted to mention is uh, most um, enterprises seem to think that there's a world with the cloud or there's a world without the cloud. The point I want to try and make is there's this very robust hybrid cloud scenario, right? And I think this is where the future is headed in terms of cloud computing, where people with existing investments in hardware locally will continue to use those resources. And then when the demand far exceeds the supply that they can locally provide, the application will be smart enough to burst into the cloud and uh, <coughs> run on the cloud as well. So an application is, is aware, self-aware enough that if it feels that it's constrained by the local resources, it will basically spin up new instances in the cloud and start running on the cloud as well. And when the traffic goes away, the instances in the cloud will be spun down and the application will come back to running purely on-premise. It's kind of the future. If you look at some of the APIs that we're building uh, around some of the cloud APIs and on-premise APIs, you basically see them converge. So our ultimate goal is to be able to write you or help you write an application once, and that app runs on-premise, on the cloud, or both places, right? Straddle uh, both infrastructures. So it's kind of the future. Um, so it's kind of obvious. I mean, the way computing works on the cloud is by scaling out, right? So you take an app and you have it run on more and more machines as your requirements for capacity go up. You don't really scale up, you kind of scale out. And <clears throat> the way we do that is basically by uh, just running data, or running your applications in massive data centers. So the cloud, if you will, is just basically a massive data center, right? Operated by whichever vendor. Um, at this point, I basically have a quick video that I normally show. But in the interest of time, given that I'm already at about half, I'm probably just going to um, point you. I think the slide deck has links to it. But basically, uh, what I would normally show here is the way that the current generation of data centers is being built and the whole container-based approach to data centers, which makes us uh, you know, very agile in creating new data centers and adding capacity to existing data centers. But I'm going to sort of jump through that, because the links are in the slide deck anyway. OK, so I'm going to basically jump to Azure now, or sort of <coughs> talk through the, um, the transformation to Azure. I just said that when you program an application for the cloud, you're literally writing a program for the data center. And, and programming massively parallel, massively distributed applications is a huge problem, right? It doesn't, the complexity doesn't scale linearly. It's sort of an exponential complexity increment when you talk about massive applications. So the goal of Azure was basically to take all of Microsoft experience in building massive uh, distributed properties, all of these, 
and sort of come up with what we call an operating system for the cloud. So what Azure does is acts as an OS for the cloud where it basically worries about all of the complexities as it relates to spanning an app across multiple machines. Some of the more um, you know, mundane issues like what happens if a machine dies when an application is running on it? Or what happens if a patch needs to be applied when your app is running on it? So we take care of all of that and all you have to do is basically worry about writing the actual code that you want executing. So if I had to define Windows Azure in one phrase, I would call it an operating system for the cloud. We basically take away all of the complexity uh, of the cloud and expose one unified API that you use to write an application. And once that app has been written, that app can run on one machine or a thousand machines concurrently without having to be you know, modified or specifically having to worry about you know, uh, the parallel parallelism that's happening there. So um, there are three broad components that Windows Azure, the operating system for the cloud, exposes. Obviously, the, the first two are pretty obvious. It exposes sort of a compute mechanism uh, for you to be able to upload apps and run on the cloud. It exposes a storage mechanism for you to be able to store data. And from an infrastructural administration point of view, it exposes what's called um, Azure Connect, or this perspective of being on a virtual network, on your virtual network. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to basically take that cluster of computers or machines that are running in the cloud and have them look as though they're extensions of your local network. So they'll basically map to the IP addressing scheme of your local namespace, of your local IP <clears throat> region. And uh, the software in the middle will basically take all the access that's happening uh, locally and then convert them, map those into the actual IP addresses in the, in the cloud. So this virtual network is basically useful if you've got you know, policies that you apply locally to machines and you want them extended into the cloud as well. So that's basically Windows Azure. Um, Windows Azure forms the backbone of the broader Azure platform, right? So there's two components, actually. There's the Windows Azure, the operating system for the cloud, and there's the Windows Azure platform that basically encompasses all of the online developer properties that Microsoft owns, which includes Windows Azure, which includes SQL Azure, because you know Windows Azure does not have a relational data storage mechanism. So SQL Azure comes in. It's a port of SQL Server for the cloud, and it basically runs on the cloud, and, and um, um, the same mechanism holds true. It basically is in the cloud. It's elastic. It's scalable. Pay for what you use and all of that, but relational database in the cloud. Azure App Fabric is a set of services that help you connect uh, applications running on-premise to applications running in the cloud. So this is interesting because a few things come into play. Fundamentally, two things come into play when you're talking about apps that need to run on the cloud that need, however, to communicate back home uh, to the machines within the infrastructure. The two things are um, access. How can a service running in the cloud sort of navigate your local firewall policies and all of that and make an inbound connection into the enterprise? Um, and number two, um, authentication and authorization, right? If you have an authentication policy in-house, how, how do you make sure that the service that's living in the cloud follows the same authentication policy and all of that? So access control and sort of the service bus, if you will, which connects the services running in the cloud to data and services running on-premise. Those two are the fundamental components of Azure App Fabric. And as you saw yesterday, we sort of support a marketplace uh, that also runs on Azure that you can use to consume data hosted by other folks or expose your own data for free or for a fee. So that's sort of the overall uh, ecosystem of, of the Windows Azure platform, on top of which you can build your own applications and host your own data. Um, so I'm just going to drill one level deeper uh, into each of these three major components, and then we'll look at an actual live implementation of an app and throw it up onto the onto the cloud. So Windows Azure, we saw, basically exposes compute and storage. The key brains, if you will, of Windows Azure is what's called the Fabric Controller. So this is basically an infrastructure layer software 
that runs on the cloud that manages the health of all of the applications and all of the hardware that the applications run on top of. So if it detects that you know, your application has crashed for whatever reason, or if it detects that one of these nodes on which your app is running has, uh, you know, has you know, died or whatever, it'll make sure that a new instance of the app is brought up and uh, you know, is, is brought online and added to the pool of running applications. So when you sort of program some of these cloud, uh, cloud-aware apps, you have to sort of keep in mind to not store state locally and, and things like that, because you should always keep in mind that this app could die at any point in time, do a sort of a non-graceful exit, exit, and a new instance, a brand new instance, will be spawned at any point of time. And so basically, that's the only thing to keep in mind um, as you sort of transition from building local on-premise apps to cloud apps. So basically, not saving any local state, saving state on you know, durable storage like the Azure storage and, and stuff like that. But Fabric Controller handles all of that. It handles load balancing, it handles you know, um, hardware failures, software failures, all of that. Um, I, sa- I mentioned Connect already. Connect basically allows you to make this infrastructure in the cloud look like an extension of your local infrastructure uh, along the same IP range. Um, looking at compute briefly, so I said compute allows you to upload your own applications into the cloud and uh, run them on the cloud. There are two broad uh, segmentations, if you will, of the kinds of compute possible on the cloud. At the, at the base layer, it's all the same. It's just basically some code that runs on the cloud. But the way we distinguish between these is by way of whether your role, your application running in the cloud, does it have a web server in front of it or does it not have a web server in front of it? So if you build a web application, a website, a web service that needs to be contacted by the outside world, you will code it as a web role. Uh, basically what will happen is that image, the virtual machine on which your code will be running, will have IIS, Internet Information Services, you know, our web server installed. If the code that you're running does not need to be contacted by the external world, then you would code it as a worker role. So if all you're doing is computing pi to 10 million digits or something, and the results will just get sent back through Azure storage or whatever, you would code it as a worker role. And everything is load balanced, and we talk about, talked about the fabric that'll make sure that everything, you know, all the integrity of all the applications is, is maintained. Um, so just a few uh, highlights. I'm going to jump through, though. Just really briefly look at storage. We expose three kinds of storage. One is blobs. And this is probably the, the storage mechanism you'll use most commonly, <clears throat> because this sort of closely mirrors local storage or the hard drive on your machine. right? So anything you can store on your hard drive could, you know, is a file. And any file can be stored in a blob. This could be text files. This could be binary data, you know, movies and audio or zip files, whatever, can be stored in a blob. It's just basically a binary large object. That's all it is. Um, any data that can be tabularly structured, right, sort of Excel level data, if you will, rows and columns, will get represented as a table. And uh, even though the name is table, it's not a relational table. It's just basically, if you will, unstructured uh, rows and column data. It's basically it. It doesn't enforce a schema. So you should not basically um, expect the table to automatically enforce schema. It does. Yeah, question. Uh, is it restricted to two dimensions or three dimensions on the table? On the table, it's restricted to two dimensions. So <clears throat> just you know x and y. Yeah. And um, <laughs> although I would think that it might be possible to extrapolate, you know, using your own code. So if you maybe have two tables that index each other and sort of extend in the third dimension, that might be an option. But out of the box, a table, Azure table is 2D. Uh, and finally, queues, which is basically, as the name suggests, just a quick data structure to pass messages back and forth with sort of a first in, first out mechanism. Question? If, uh, if the documents are getting stored as a blob, how do we apply search to the criteria? Could you repeat the yeah, question? Yeah, the question was if the documents basically get, uh, yeah, if the documents basically get stored in the blob as binary uh, data, how do you apply search criteria, right? So uh, there are interesting ways to do it. Basically, 
uh, the Azure storage mechanism will not extract metadata and make it accessible or searchable by default. So if, if that searchability is, is paramount, if it's important, what we basically recommend is sort of use blobs to store data, but then use Azure tables to sort of maintain a separate metadata table. So a sort of a link to the blob, and then some of the keywords or tags, if you will, that uh, represent the blog. And that could either be manual, or that could be automatic, where some worker process comes in, looks at the contents of the blob, and extracts a bunch of meaningful information and stores it in the table. And then the search would actually happen on the table, and then get dereferenced back to the, the blob. I don't know if that made sense. So that means. Uh that means we have to have an external uh, Apple, what you call as a processing or a business layer to extract the metadata before storing the information. Yes. Uh, the way it stands now, uh, yes, the blob does not expose a structured, so it doesn't do something like Windows Explorer does, if you will, where it exposes you know, all the files that it has and all of the metadata about the files and all of that. It doesn't by default do that. You can, you can with each blob image, though, you can save some metadata. I mean, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's about <clears throat> 8 kilobytes or 24 kilobytes. It's a, it's a small amount, but you can store some metadata. But it's your responsibility to store the metadata in with the blob. So Azure storage would not look into the content of your blob and extract meaningful information and store that as metadata is what I'm trying to say. And what are the size limitations? Like if you're a regular OS, you have a size limitation that you can store like 4 gig yeah. or something like that, right? But what is about the blob? Because you said it's very small. So how no, does so, it? No, 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 no. The metadata field is, is relatively small. The blob, I'm not sure that it has a size limitation at all. It, sorry? No, it's it's definitely not constrained. So that I know for sure. It's not constrained by the NTFS sli uh, size limi limitation. Because basically what's happening is behind the scenes, it's got a storage, um, storage array that basically sort of breaks the blob, if you will, across multiple hard drives if need be. So it's not constrained by the traditional size limitations of NTFS or, or FAT. Um, so that's a good point to check out. A simple web search should, should give you that information. I know that a queue, for instance, has a size limitation of 8 kilobytes. So a queue message can only be 8 kilobytes. Uh, a table. Um, also has a size limitation, not in the size of the overall table, but in the size of each field. Like each column data in the table can only be certain kilobytes. The blob, as far as I know, does not um, have a size limitation. It can grow to the size of your storage account, uh, worst case scenario. So, The storage account, though, has a size limitation of uh, a few hundred terabytes or so. so. But again, a simple search should reveal that number. Uh, question, sir. Um, if Microsoft were to develop um, an overlay that would facilitate um, storage of heterogeneous data with uh, some control over metadata annotation, mm -hmm. that would actually be a big win for the scientific community. I know there's a lot of people that have lots of data. Right. They don't all relate to each other, right. but they want to get it stored somewhere, and they want to be able to search over it. So if, yes. if you can come up with tools for that. Absolutely. I think, I think it's good feedback. Um, Jan, is there a way to collect this feedback and pass it on to the apart? Apparently, he didn't write this on the sheet. Um, I'm going to set up some kind of mechanism for you guys to you know, send us really concrete requests and feedback. Yeah, so. uh, but I will remember to send this gentleman's feedback yeah. straight to you. But it totally does make sense. I mean, if there's a, there's a sort of a. Um, a simplified mechanism where I can upload something and uh, have metadata associated with it that's easily searchable, okay. that gets grouped up and easily searchable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean you'll find there are certain third-party applications. That, in fact, I can show you one. Um, so there's this um, application called uh, Cloud Storage Studio, and I could basically. So what this is doing now is it basically is giving me a view of what's in my Azure uh, blob storage. So I have these folders, if you will. We call them containers instead of folders. Uh, so this basically reads containers. For those of you in the back, um, it's kind of hard to read. This says containers, and these are the separate 
containers that I have within my storage account. And I have the storage account called, say, docs, uh, which has a few document, uh, a few Word files and um, PowerPoint files. So this is some metadata that um, is exposed uh, automatically. And this sort of gives me a sort of a Windows Explorer look and feel. And I can basically go in and, uh, let's see, view edit blob properties. And I can come in and insert some metadata. A metadata is just basically a name value combination. So I could do something like you know, topic or something and say Azure and say insert metadata. And now this is basically part of this blob's metadata. So blob storage absolutely does support metadata, like I said. But then once I save it and close it, now how this becomes searchable is an interesting uh, point. And I think back to your point, I think it's very valid feedback in terms of uh, exploring options of making these searchable just as you would a local file system. So, yeah. OK, any other questions so far? Yeah. Cannot be done in a cloud, Azure, then it can be done in regular OS that we have. Yeah, uh, so the question, yeah, everybody heard the question. Um, if I did this talk about eight months back, um, I would have told you that in Azure, you do not run as administrator, right? So anything that requires admin privileges, you couldn't have done. But in the PDC that just happened last year, the Professional Developers Conference, we added that feature, right? So when your application runs in Azure, it runs as admin. So you can basically do everything on, your app can do anything on the cloud that an admin could on the local box. Um, I would say technically there is really nothing you cannot do, except there are certain things we would recommend you do not do. So things like, for instance, not save anything to your local drive, right? Not save anything to your local C drive or whatever the drive that's exposed in the cloud. Just because, like I said, if that machine goes down for whatever reason, a new machine will get spawned with, uh, with an instance of your application, and that C drive content would not have been replicated, right? So the temporal data that's in the machine that hasn't been committed to Azure storage would be lost forever. So we recommend not saving local state. We recommend not caching something locally unless that data can be reconstituted on the fly by some other instance, stuff like that. But literally, it's a box in the sky. I'll actually show you. You can actually even remote desktop to one of those and, and you know just do whatever you want. Configure it any way you want. Uh, we even allow you to build your own custom image, your own virtual machine image. Uh, based off of Windows Server 2008, and upload it to the cloud, and we will take that VHD and run it for you, right? So if your application needs, I don't know, certain DLLs, if it needs a few specialized applications already installed in the image, we will absolutely have uh, facilities to let you do it. Probably the only thing that you won't see from us in Azure for, for probably a long, long time is the ability to run a non-Windows operating system. So we do not intend, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, hosting a non-Windows OS, for instance. You won't see us host you know, sort of a Linux variant on the cloud, right? which you can with Amazon today, uh, but not with Windows Azure. Because it's going to be, because most of our infrastructure, all of our infrastructure, including the hypervisors and the virtualization infrastructure, is all optimized for Windows Server 2008. And that basically gives you a huge advantage, because when you run on the cloud, even though you're running in a virtualized environment, your performance envelope is at the 90th percentile of what it would be if you ran on bare metal hardware, right? And that 90th percentile performance is only achieved because of the hyper-optimized hypervisor um, that runs on the cloud. And so if we changed the OS or if we changed even the, hard or the hardware configuration, uh, we would basically have to retweak the hypervisor for each of those. That's why we basically say, even though you can upload your own hard drive images, VHDs, they need to be based off of Windows Server 2008 R2, just because the hypervisor is optimized for that environment. Question? Yeah. Uh, the thing is, uh, if you create a particular instance, or if you request a particular configuration for Azure instance, right. is it consistent? Like, if you had to change later on based on a performance issues or something like that, 
does it automatically reconfigure the RAM and uh, disk, or is it something that you have to request a new uh, instance altogether? Right. So the there are two parts to that. We can add and remove instances on the fly. So if you basically upload an application and say, I want 20 instances of this app to run, that number 20 can be upped or lowered on the fly. So you can basically come in and say, I, now I need 30, and we'll spin up 10 more. And now you can say, I want that number back to 10, and we'll take down 20, right? But if you want the actual instance, the VM, uh, the hardware configuration of the VM to change, for instance. So now, instead of saying, I, instead of quad-core machines, host me on an eight-core machine. That would basically require taking down the application and uh, bringing up a new instance of you know the virtual image on an eight-core machine and loading your application onto that. So that would mean bringing down the application and then re-initiating it on a different kind of uh, runtime environment. Did that make sense? So instances can be increased and lowered uh, at runtime without bringing down the service. So instead of five instances, I can give you 10 or take down five or whatever. But the type of instance on which you're running, when I say the type of instance, I mean the size of the instance. Whether you're running on a single core machine, uh, single core VM image, dual core, quad core, eight core. So we offer four sizes, right? Um, uh, small, medium, large, extra large. Now we offer extra small, but basically small, medium, large, extra large. The only difference is between uh, the size of the machine on which you're running. A small machine has one core and 768 uh, megabytes of RAM. Uh, a medium machine has two cores and 1.5 gigs. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, the next size up is large, four cores and, and uh, three gig. And the extra large has eight cores and six gigs of RAM, right? So if you change that instance size, we will have to bring down your app and redeploy it just because the, the um, image on which your app is running has to be changed, transplanted over to a different piece of hardware, literally. Right? So that's basically what happens there. OK, so. I see I have about 15 minutes. And so what I'm going to do is basically the next two minutes, I'm going to try and get through the slides and show you the demo, because I really want us to have an experience of the actual portal. So I'm not going to, we looked at all of these. Um, key thing I want to mention is all of Azure storage is exposed via REST. You know, we looked at web services and REST yesterday, which basically means that you could store, you could store your data in Azure storage and still access that from any platform in the world. Now, these could be platforms on premise. These could be Windows platforms, non-Windows platforms. So basically, the point I'm trying to make is if you store data in Azure storage, it's not just accessible from Azure. It's accessible from any node anywhere that can talk HTTP. Basically, that's it. Um, so I'm going to jump through tables. Basically, I said you know tables are rows and columns. They're, we call them entity and uh, entities and records. And queues are the primary mechanism to communicate between roles. Uh, so basically, a queue is sort of, like I said, a first-in, first-out messaging uh, mechanism. And we recommend that you have your components communicate to each other through a queue, just because, like I said, I mean, these, these are very temporary. I mean, these could die at any time. So you don't want your web role initiating a direct connection to your worker role just because what if the worker dies? And then now your web role is just waiting in a sort of an infinite waiting phase. So use the queue. And even if this um, worker dies, the new worker that gets spawned will know to consume from this queue and keep processing the message. And we have semantics in place that if a message from the queue is pulled and not explicitly deleted, then the message will reappear back in 30 seconds. So even if a worker role pulls a message and starts processing it, but sort of crashes in between, uh, that, that queue item, that message will not get lost because it'll show up again in 30 seconds because it has not been explicitly deleted. <laughs> so SQL Azure, uh, really quick, exposes the basic database engine, exposes the reporting and the data sync functionality. 
uh, basically, which means it allows you to store relational data, it allows you to run reports on relational data, it allows you to sync between multiple instances of SQL Azure or between a SQL Server and a SQL Azure instance. So if one instance has an update happen on it, all the other instances will get you know the changes propagated to them if you run, if you use data sync. Um, the key thing to keep in mind is the the current size of a SQL Azure instance can grow up to 50 gigabytes. If your application has a database larger than 50 gig, you have to shard them into uh, multiple databases. And the reason it's it's um, truncated at 50 gig is to make sure that it scales on the web, right? If if the sizes get too large, and if you basically have to maintain data integrity, it at one point becomes prohibitively expensive to make sure that the update replicates across all the you know related tables in a timely fashion. And so basically, we sort of truncate it at 50 gigabytes, and you basically manually shard uh, your instance across instances. Uh, finally, App Fabric, like I said, mentions uh, you know offers a service bus, offers access control, and offers a distributed cache. And the service bus basically, let me jump in here. It literally does this: if one service in you know some organization or on premise wants to talk to another service in a different org or on the cloud or whatever, and if these are separated by firewalls and network boundaries that do not allow inbound connections. The service bus acts as sort of a relay in between, if you will, that allow two applications to talk via that relay. So the way it works really simply is the service bus initiates um, the, the applications within those orgs will initiate a request to the service bus. And the firewall, since it's seeing that it's an outbound request, will allow that request to go through. The service bus then what's going to do is it's going to take this connection and hold it open. It's going to keep the connection open, and then any uh, data that needs to be transferred back and forth is done via the service bus. It'll basically take data from here and transfer it here, and vice versa. If it detects, however, that the the boundaries will allow for direct connection, it'll make the direct connection happen and and back off. But otherwise, it's going to just basically act as a router or a relay uh, to allow communication to happen. So that was basically the all-up look. Um, th so we looked at Windows Azure. We looked at the Azure App Fabric. We looked at SQL Azure. And the last point I want to make is basically this is not a pure Microsoft platform play, right? I mean, everything, like I said, exposes REST. Everything exposes OData. And as we've seen over the last couple of days, all of these technologies are interoperable, which basically means you can target Azure using a bunch of different technologies, a bunch of different languages, or a bunch of different IDE environments, and so on and so forth. So it's a very completely interoperable platform um, to play with. So with that, what I'm going to do is sort of, in the next 10 minutes, sort of give you a very abbreviated um, experience of programming a Windows Azure application. So what I'm going to do is fire up Visual Studio. And I'm going to run this as administrator just because a couple of components require me to be admin. So when Visual Studio comes up, I already have the Azure SDK installed. Um, what I would do then is basically just do new project as usual. And in the, in the dialog that comes up, there's, there's going to be, once you install the Azure SDK, you will have this cloud tab. And then you hit cloud. You give it a project name. Let's just say, hello, uh, MSR, and say OK. And at this point, it's basically going to throw up another dialog and ask you, OK, I see you're trying to build a Windows Azure compute application. What kind of roles do you want? Do you want web roles? Do you want worker roles? Um, you know, what kind of roles? And you'll see you have a traditional ASP.NET web role, ASP.NET MVC web role, uh, a web service web role, or you have a worker role. But if you wanted to build something, say, non-Microsoft technologies like ASP.NET, if you wanted to, say, build a PHP web role, you can just, just choose the generic CGI web role and any language that supports fast CGI, Python, Perl, any of those languages support fast CGI <coughs> will be uh, programmable using this mechanism. I'm just going to, for now, choose a, a regular ASP.NET web role. 
It's called WebRoll1. I'm okay with that name. I'm going to choose okay. In fact, you know what? Let me throw in a worker role as well. So I got a web role and a worker role in this project. I'm going to say okay. And so it's going to go off and, and build the default ASP.NET web role application. It's going to build the default worker role application and come back in a second. Okay, so basically, um, in the solution structure, let me just minimize these for a second. What you'll see is you, you have your web role, you have your worker role, and this is the, the all-up cloud solution. And basically, you see that it basically has these two roles, and it's also got some configuration files. Let me increase the font on this. Um, and this is the config file that you can actually modify to say how many instances do you want, or how many, uh, you know, or if you need any specific settings in your roles. Because remember, again, what's happening is these applications, when you deploy to the cloud, will go and get installed on the VM and start running, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, you don't have any direct control of the VM, so it's almost as though you're handing this app off to your admin and saying, hey, admin, for this app to run, I need you know, the following to happen. I need the machine configured this way. I need this port open, because I'm going to talk on that port. Mm, maybe I need you know, um, diagnostics enabled and all of that. So this is literally your instruction set to your virtual admin, which in this case is the um, the Azure, you know, infrastructure layer. So you basically say, I need this many instances. I need, you know, these ports open and all of that. In this case, we aren't opening any ports, but literally you can configure all of those things. And what's going to happen is the Azure Fabric Controller will will get this file first, and when it sets up the VM, it's going to set it up uh, with all of these requirements. And then following that, you can actually go in and actually just, you know, build your application. So basically. Here's my default.aspx page, which is basically my default <coughs> ASP page. And I would just go and build this exactly like a, would, a regular ASP.NET application. And this is really the best part of Azure development using Visual Studio is basically you take all of your existing know-how in building existing mm -hmm. Microsoft technology applications like you know, web apps and services and sort of port them to the cloud. So the experience is exactly the same. I can come in. I can use the toolbox, the drag and drop, design support, designer support. Uh, maybe I can throw in, let's just do a regular Hello World application. So I'm going to throw in a text box. I'm going to throw in a button next to it. I'm going to throw in a label that's going to display the Hello World message. So having brought these three things, let me bring the label to the next line. and. I can just code it up. I basically go in, I get full Visual Studio support. I can basically say a label, let me increase the font, label one dot, label one dot text, dot template control, equals hello plus, uh, what was that, text box one dot text. For now, in the interest of time, let's just do this. Uh, the key thing I want to also point out now is at this point, I can just hit you know, F5 or hit Start Debugging. And here's what's going to happen now. It's very cool. Obviously, you don't want to build your application and throw it up on the cloud, see if it runs, bring it back, and keep you know, modifying it. It's, it's sort of the whole deploy to the cloud takes about 10 minutes. right? And so if you had to do that every single time, it's kind of detrimental to your productivity. So what we have done is sort of along with the SDK, we have shipped a high fidelity, uh, high fidelity. So I don't know what that sign means. Are you trying to say it's, I've got only ten minutes, or? Oh, oh sorry. Okay, no. Uh, I've got five minutes. Okay, cool. Um, oh, okay, gotcha. Sorry. Um, so we've shipped a very high fidelity simulation of the cloud on your local machine. So what that's going to let you do is, I thought I hit F5. OK, it says running the deployment. And I don't see the deployment open up, though, which is interesting. Shift F5 to stop. Hmm. OK, while it stops. Uh, so yeah. Um, 
still running it for some weird reason. Let me go in and look at the UI. So this is basically the UI for the local cloud environment, if you will. It's going to come up hopefully in a second. So it's still doing something, which is weird. Oh, here it is. So this is an MMC snap-in uh, that basically shows me any local instances that are running. And right now, this Hello MSR application, if you can see here, uh, is running one web role and one worker role. And here it comes up finally, my uh, web page. It should have that same UI that we built up. And you can see here that I'm running one instance of my web role and one instance of my worker role, which right now isn't doing anything. Question, sir? So I'm a debug. So I'm a developer and I'm writing code. If I wanted to get feedback on that, could I package this up and then another user on another computer run this emulator and just run this application? Absolutely, yes. So well, as long that, as they have the Azure SDK, you can send them the, the compile, the CS package file. We call it the CSPKG, Cloud Service Package file. You send them that and they'll be able to run it on their local box. As so well. they won't need to install IIS and any other prereqs? Uh, IIS is a prereq for Azure SDK to be installed. Okay. So they would need IIS just because uh, this web role is actually running on your local instance of IIS. Okay. So they would need IIS, but then they wouldn't need anything beyond the runtime, the Azure runtime on their machine. That's basically yeah all they they need. So this gives you a very you know sort of a fast turnaround in terms of you know sort of the build debug build debug cycle, and you can see all of the you know spew debug spew from your applications that are running. The next step is you would take this <coughs> and you would upload it to the cloud, right? So the way you would do that is you would go to windows.azure.com and uh, that, that should bring out the Windows Azure portal, which I think I already have opened, or okay, it's opening here. So, which is relatively slow, okay, here it is. So this is the Windows Azure portal and it basically gives you a sort of a control grid of you know, how, how many compute nodes you have running or compute uh, instances you have running, how many storage accounts or compute accounts you have and all of that. So I would go in here and let's just see what the provisioning a new compute account looks like, right? So a compute account is basically what's called a hosted service. We call it a hosted service. A storage account is what we call a storage service or a storage account. Uh, user management allows you to go in and, and you know, customize you know, your billing information, all of that. VM images, you know how I said you can create your own virtual image, virtual hard drive and upload it? You would do it through here. CDN is our content distribution network. So all of our storage accounts are backed by a content distribution network. So you can basically activate this to um, allow faster access to all the data that you've got in the storage. So let's just quickly run through what creating a new hosted account would look like. You just basically provide a name for your service. I'm going to say hello MSR and see if it's available. <coughs> and you provide a URL for accessing your service. I'm going to again say if hello MSR is available. Okay, the requested name has already been taken. How about hello MSR1? Okay, that's fine. Now you choose a region where you want your application or service to be deployed. And we have six locations around the world North and South uh, Central US, North and South, uh, North and West Europe and East and South Asia, or you can choose anywhere Asia, anywhere Europe, and anywhere US. So you can basically choose, I'm gonna choose, let's say, North Central US. This is the data center just north of Chicago, and I'm gonna say, choose this. And I can come in and grab the cloud service package file that I talked about. So right here, I can click this Hello MSR project, click on Publish, you wanna start debugging, yes. And when I say publish, it'll create, let me show you what it does. It'll basically compile the whole application and create a cloud service package file and a cloud service configuration file. Um, publish started, and it's gonna do that in a second. So I would basically just take those two files and upload it to the cloud, and my application is gonna be running on the cloud. So I knew that I might run out of, t out of time, so here's the two files um, that the Visual Studio generated for me, and I would just point those two files here and say okay, and that's it. But in the interest of time, I already had uploaded an instance already. So here is that instance. 
I called it simple demo. And I can go in and click this URL, simple demo app.cloudapp.net, and it's that same app. So I could basically say MSR, hit the button, and basically say MSR. Oh, I didn't have it say hello, but whatever. Um, and in my last 30 seconds, what I'm going to show you really quick. So again, this app is running from the cloud. If you look at the URL, it's simpledemo.cloudapp.net. And cloudapp.net is the domain name that Microsoft uh, Windows Azure uses for hosting Azure programs. The final thing I want to show you is I, I told you how I, I will show you how Azure exposes the infrastructure as a service uh, functionality to you. And the way you can do that is basically in this dashboard, you can see that in my simple demo, app, demo application, I have this one role and I have this one instance. Now again, what, like I said, each instance runs in its own VM, its own Windows <coughs> server instance, right? I am now able to connect to it. So I can basically say connect. And what it's going to do is it's going to open uh, an RDP file, a remote desktop file, that I can click on open. And oh, because the, the firewall is blocking it. So let me do this really quick. I'm going to disconnect from the Microsoft network. And this one is outside of the building. Oh, no, I'm connected to the, to the employee network. Let me connect to uh, my Wi Fi hotspot. Uh, I think it's connecting. There it is. Dial. So I'm now going out of the Microsoft network, connecting to my hotspot. That's now connected. Now let me hit connect on this. Okay. The RDP file comes up. I hit open. And now it asks me. Uh, it comes up. And when I set up this image, I had activated remote desktop functionality and had given it a username and password. I just used that same username and password. And now if you look. Word. And what's going to happen now is it's going to let me connect to this machine in the cloud. I'm going to say yes, connect me there. And so hopefully in a few seconds, uh, this is my machine in the cloud on which the hello, uh, you know, simple demo service, the hello world service is now running. Uh, just basically, I'll show you a, cue, a few really cool things. Um, if you do, wait, we are in command. Uh, let's do an, a quick IP config. It shows you some really cool things. Um, so the code name for Azure before it became Azure was Red Dog. So you see, they're basically using the same, you know, top-level domain, reddog.microsoft.com. This is our IP. Um, so you can actually now this is your machine. So you can basically come and install any app you want. Again, like I said, you are admin on this box. So you can basically. Customize this box as you see fit. You can go into IIS and see that ap actual application running. So this is literally the, the machine in the cloud in the Windows Azure Chicago data center that's hosting our Hello World application. So with that, that's all. I, I have way more things I want to talk about with you, but I'm sadly out of time. Uh, do we have time for maybe a couple of questions? or um, Maybe one or two. One or two questions? Yeah, because I do have volunteers to show one of the things is actually inspired by your work, by your support. Oh, they want okay. to show their work. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. OK. So, so how about just some, maybe? Yeah, quick questions. There was a question. Yes, sir. Uh, for students that are using Visual Studio and developing uh, cloud projects, uh, after they test them in the local environment, right. are you going to offer any free capability to deploy to the cloud? So we're still trying to come up with one unified offering for uh, students all over the US. We're still working on that, but for you know selected faculty that you know we have established relationships with, we actually come up with some way to do it. Uh, to, like today, we have an offering that will allow any student to go in and get a 30-day Azure Pass, which will allow them to uh, get access on Azure without having to enter credit card or registration <laughs> information and stuff like that. So I will. Uh, I will follow up with Jan and uh, send the instructions on how students can actually activate the 30-day pass, and uh, if you can forward it out, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much. I have a few thank cards sitting here. Thank you so much. Here. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure.